Well, we're doing a series called Redefining Faith, and uh, one scripture to me defines for me uh, what faith really is, and it requires a lot of faith to believe every aspect. There's 10 different aspects. I'm going to kind of go through the message relatively quickly. Uh, it's a full message, and so I, a short amount of time. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Since God chose you, that's an amazing thing. I mean, you may look in the mirror and go, well, why wouldn't he? But um, look closer and you may realize that it was a real stretch for God to choose you to be holy, because we weren't. The holy people he loves, madly in love with you, couldn't be more in love with you, made you to be a fascination to him. And then it says we got to do something, clothe yourself. How many of you clothed yourself this morning? Well, the Bible is saying put on some more clothes here. Close yourself with tender-hearted. That word, man, that's, that's an awesome word. Tender-hearted. Mercy. Kindness. Humility. Gentleness and patience. Wow. Now, I believe uh, Abraham had those qualities. I'm going to talk about Abraham today. I want to have those qualities in my own life. Abraham is called the father of the faith. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then you are a child of Abraham. Abraham is your distant daddy. He's a man, the Bible says, that we have descended from because he's the guy who stepped up and stepped out. And so my message is redefining faith, the faith tests of Abraham, which will be our faith test. I could call this the faith tests of Francis, the faith, faith, test, faith tests of your name because all of us will go through these things. They are real tests, and I, they're before me. They were in the past, they're the present, they're the future. I'm going to read some verses in Hebrews 11. It is by faith Abraham obeyed. That's an important thing. When God called him to leave home, to go to another land that God would give him as an inheritance, he went without knowing where he was going. I'll just tell you, a lot of us leave home thinking we know where we're going, and then the unexpected intercepts us. Um, we take comfort in knowing where we're going. We take comfort in thinking we know what's about to happen. Then the left hooks from either heaven or hell happen, and the issue is are we ready for them? They're coming for all of us, only to make us better, to make us the per persons that God wants us to be. But he went out not knowing where he was going. That's a big deal. He left the comforts of his life. And even when he had reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. He was like a foreigner. We are like that, living in an intense and when I saw the word intense, I've been intense since I was a young Christian. <laughs> Anyone around me knows I'm intense. So anyway, it's a little humor there. Anyway, and so <laughs> did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward. How many of you are confidently looking forward? If you're not, you need to take a reassessment of who God is. I guarantee you every one of us have had God do enough in our life to enable you to be confidently looking forward. You have amnesia right now. You banged your head. And God's trying to cause you to remember who you are. Remember what he's done. Confidently look forward. You know, I, I do believe for all of us our best days are ahead. That's not a nice little sentence you say, you know, when you're high or something. But it's something when you say it when you really believe that there's a God who saves the best wine for last, who causes all things to work together for the good, who makes everything the enemy meant for evil to turn around for good. Again, the jury testimony today. You know, stick a fork in it. At one point, they're done. He's done. And God intercepts his life. And now his, his beautiful wife, just coming in today, said, things are really going amazing. And you can always make you nervous whenever you make that sentence, you know, you say, because what's going to happen next? But, you know, I'm just grateful that God is able. God is able. I don't care what storms I have to go through. My future is awesome. If I could see the future God has pl planned for me, I'd be trusting him every day of my life. And I'm just trying to get you infected with that thought, okay? I'm just trying to share the virus because it's a good virus that you need to catch. That's your future. That's what Abraham had. Uh, Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. First, 
17, it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac. Now, let me say this. Offering Isaac, the seed of promise, the very thing that he had waited for. So don't be too attached to anything. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my body. I love my health. I love my mind. I love lots of things. I'm only attached to him. Everything else may come and go. I'm attached to him. You know, I'm an intense guy. I guess I said I've dwelled intense. Um, when my children were being born, I knew I was having twins. I'm in a chapel in a hospital in Marysville. And they did a C-section on Susie. And so I'm there by myself crying for about an hour and a half, two hours. And in this very active brain, I'd already done the funerals on my entire family. Okay, I already preached their funerals, had an altar call. We had a powerful altar call. <laughs> Lots of folks came to the Lord. So in my little brain, I'd already traversed a worst case scenario. Um, in somewhat in a guarded way just to prepare myself just in case anything did happen. And then I see these blue babies brought to me that look like they were in trouble. But the nurse is smiling, so maybe they're not in trouble. It looks like maybe the fact that they're blue is good. They're just Murphs, Smurfs or something. That's what they are. <laughs> so this is where, in my life, I have to discipline myself to believe the absolute best. Now, I've grown a lot in those last 40-some-odd years. I've seen God do countless things. And the Bible says experience gives hope. Experience of men and women of God gives hope. Experience of men and women of God that we know gives hope. Experience in our own life over time give hope. At some point you say to yourself, when am I going to get it? I mean, I've said to God on many occasions, Lord, you don't have to do anything else. I mean, stop, stop. You've already done enough. I just need to remember what you've done. You've proven yourself to me. In a sense, Abraham did, so I'll continue. And Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God is able to bring him back to life. I don't care what I have to give, God can bring it back to life. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back to life. So the tests that we're about to see of Abraham are our tests as well. Here they are. Number one, Abraham left Ur of Ur and Haran for an unknown destination in God's direction. Genesis 12. Leave your native country, your relatives, family, to a land I'll show you, and I'll bless you and others. You'll be a blessing to others. And at that point, Abraham believed it. He built an altar. Altars are connections with you and God. I was, I was in Dallas yesterday, flew back late last night, and talking to individuals who mentioned things to me that were turning points in their life. And I said, do you remember the physical place where you were, where you prayed that prayer? And invariably, they remember that moment. They remember the spot they were, where they made an altar. Uh, a guy in a hotel room. We, talk, we met a guy. Okay, we had many supernatural experiences. Uh, Rice Brooks, who I was traveling with, was doing an evangelism seminar. We were taking Ubers. And Mark the Evangelist, his last name was Mark Evangelista, from the Philippines, picked us up, was attending the church we were speaking at, Gateway. And so we invited Mark Evangelista to come to an Evangelista conference. <laughs> and talking to Mark, who sat next to me in the conference, he mentioned how he was, you know, thug, all kinds of things. But in a hotel room, he made a commitment. I, and I said, do you remember the spot? I remember the spot. Abraham made an altar. You, I remember spots in my life where I made altars. Application number one, do you trust God with your future? Do I trust God with my future? I expect moments in my future to be very difficult. You may notice older people are less strong. Have you noticed that at all? <laughs> older people have less sharp minds. Has anyone noticed that? <laughs> older people sometimes lose people that they have lived with for a long time. Anyone notice that? I mean, getting older is not like it just gets, it gets, 
the challenges of today are preparing me for the greater challenges of tomorrow. And I've already decided I'm going to be victorious by the grace of God in those challenges. I'm going to trust God, whatever happens. Ever feel like you're getting whiplash with the twists and turns in life? Transitions are in store for all of us, but don't get too settled on what you think is or should be happening. If a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, then our lives take less than two hours of God time. So I've been pastoring this church for 21 years or 21 minutes. God time. And I'm heading into an eternity in about a half hour. I expect to have 30 more years. Or 40. Just in case you're always going to go lower. The point is, life goes fast. The Bible says, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and van vanishes away. The changes and transition we experience in life are all tests, proving our character and molding us to become like Jesus. Number two test, Abraham directed a peaceful separation from his nephew Lot. Finally, Abraham, Genesis 13, said to Lot, let's not allow this. So they're both blessed. Both blessed. But they need to divide because they can't, the ground cannot handle all their herds. Let's not allow this conflict to come between us. Take your choice of any section of the land you want. Lot chose for himself. That's a little challenge there. That's not a great sentence. That was the issue. Lot chose for himself. I am not the brains of the operation. I don't know what's best for me. I never have, I never will. The best I can do is trust the one who knows all options. Lot chose for himself. Abraham held it like this. Lot held it like this. Lot got in trouble. You may have heard of Sodom and Gomorrah. Not a place to have a timeshare. <laughs> Lot moved his tents to a place near Sodom, but the people of this area were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against him. Number two application, do I trust God even when it's, I seem to be receiving unfair treatment? It was Abraham's uncle Abe. Uncle Abe could have pulled a seniority card and said, Lot, I'm taking this land. Find a spot. He and said, said, wherever you want, Lot, choose it. And even as Lot was walking away, God spoke to Abraham. Everything you see is yours. <laughs> so Lot is thinking he's walking into a place that he'd have to be rescued from. And Abraham is told by God, it's all yours. Uh, I just would say that generational handoffs can be a challenge. I, I just want to give you a summary of what's gone on here. When Luis Palau came to our city, maybe eight years ago, I knew that he'd begin to rally pastors and leaders in our region. 420 plus churches came together. That broadened our connectivity. City Pastors Fellowship continued to blossom and at one point, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. I'm a twin. I have twins. That the region and the rock were now going to be my twins. When that happened, I knew I would not be able to devote as much attention to the rock. And so I invited Pastor Bob to be co-senior pastor. He kept vying for that position. He kept nudging. No, I'm kidding. It's a little joke there. I knew it was the last thing he wanted, and that would only increase his prayer life for me, that he'd be praying that I would be healthy as long as possible. And so that enabled me, though, for a few years to be working with the twins. I have twins, so I treat them with great equity. Over time, though, I realized I didn't have the rock next vision, and that would not be fair to the rock just to hang. And so I just began to say, Lord, what is the future? I'm incredibly grateful that God raised up Brandon, who came as a son with his beautiful family when he was 17 years old, and has grown up in this house, massive leadership gift, led our youth, and then began to mind a discipleship program among our young people that was clearly a next generation vision, a baton being passed, 35 years old now, but I felt a few years ago when it was germinating in my heart, a little more time to get him ready, me ready for that transition. Then it was announced a couple years ago that would happen. And really, you know, any kind of transition, guys, is a very moving emotional experience. I will tell you, now at the, near the end of that transition, it really has been extraordinary. 
how Brandon and Rachel, the elders and leaders, have responded. They have been very gracious to us, incredibly generous to us, very kind to us, because I didn't have a next. I needed uh, to be able to work on some things in this last year or so that the Lord provided for my family, for me. And they gave me great latitude to do that. But the way he has grown, Rachel and the young people that are here, from Aaron, I mean, Morgan, you see, Ryan, you see the leadership here. Another generation is leading. Uh, obviously, they're connected multi-generationally. But um, this is not an Abraham and Lot scenario, okay? This is a divine scenario where a father is blessed to have a son so incredibly capable as Brandon is, and a daughter. Uh, I remember when Rachel came to our daughter's wedding. That's how we met her. Uh, came to Deborah's wedding some uh, 12 and a half years ago. And um, now they are going to be the pastors. And I'm incredibly excited about it. The church is going to be in great hands. The other leaders who are here with them are extraordinary. Give them a hand. Would you please do that? Thank you. So, so when I talk about the Abraham and Lot scenario, that is a generational challenge. And some places don't navigate it well. By the grace of God, we have navigated it well. And that will continue. I mean, we are well past the rapids, okay? We are now just cruising out at white waters behind us. Because it takes, some adjust it takes a lot of emotion to accept, to fully understand what God is doing. I would say, though, in our culture, uh, there's a battle that goes on with a victim mentality. And um, Abraham did not have a victim mentality. He was willing to give away the best. That's the heart of God that God wants us to have. Number three, Abraham rescued Lot for five kings. I'm not going to spend time on it, but I would say this. For him to go with 318 men uh, in his household, next slide, he was risking everything to rescue naive, foolish Lot. There was no guarantee he'd come back. He was taking everything he owned, he put. It was an all-in moment. Let me encourage you. Every one of us will be presented with more and more all-in moments. If the Christian life is an all-in moment. It's, my wife, when I got married, she didn't say, just be faithful as best you can. I mean, just do your best. As long as I know you're trying, it's good. No, no, she has expected 100% faithfulness. She's obsessed with it. I'm kidding. It's a little joke, it's just a little humor there. It's not, there's nothing obsessive. We think it's normal. Well, God wants, as he was all in, he's asking us to be all in. And there is no other in but all so Abraham risked all to go. Does my faithfulness to others show my trust in God's faithfulness? In other words, we're going to have to lay our lives down for others. That's what we do. That's our lives. Four, Abraham gave a tithe to the godly king of Salem, Melchizedek. Many consider this a Christophany. It was a pre-incarnation of Jesus. So Genesis 14, Abraham gives his first and best. The question is application. Do I, do I give proper honor to God? I just will tell you guys, the first and best, the cream off the top is what God is asking us to give. I've been endeavoring to do that. I'm not perfect at all, but I have time, I have talents, I have treasures, you have the same thing. Don't expect to get God's best unless you're willing to give him your best. I'm sorry. If you want to hedge your bets, tip God here and there, pat him on the head, throw him a bone, whatever boomerang you're throwing is coming back to you. And so I have tried, I've endeavored, I'm going to give him my best of my time, my talents, my treasures. That's how I'm going to my future. Because there's only one that can bring increase to my life is God. My planting and my watering, the Bible says, is nothing without his increase. It's not shrewdness, it's not ingenuity, it's the favor of the Lord that surrounds us and provides for us. So give God your best. Honor him with your best. Number five, Abraham trusted God's promise that he would have a son. 
Sometime later, Genesis 15, the Lord spoke to Abraham in a vision and said, Do not be afraid, Abraham, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant, no, your servant Ishmael will not be your heir. So Abraham, trying to get that seed of promise in his own strength, had a relationship with Hagar, the maid, out of which came Ishmael, where the whole Arabic reality has descended from, and that Arab-Israeli thing has been a blessing ever since. I mean, it's just an awesome. But that attempt to make something happen did not help. So I, I can't make it happen. I can't pull on leaves to make them grow. I, all I can do is allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in my life. So, but it was a disappointment to Abraham to hear that Ishmael wasn't it because he had nothing besides Ishmael at that point. Isaac was still, I mean, it was a crazy thought because he's 900 years old. There's nothing left. Verse 5, then, then Lot, the Lord took Abram outside to him and look at, up into the sky and count the stars if, if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord. He's 100 years old. There's no reason he should be believing this. Everything in the natural said impossible. Forget it. First it is impossible. Then it is difficult. Then it is done. Number five, how often do I consciously reaffirm my trust in God's promises? I, I just trust God. I don't care what I see. I don't care what's happening. What is happening is the least significant thing. I'm not walking by sight. I'm walking by faith. I'm not this little naive, oh, I'm just going to trust the Lord. No, I, God has given me promises whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we can be partakers of a divine nature. Now I'll tell you, if you don't read the word of God, you're not going to know what the promises are. And faith only comes by hearing the word of God. If you lack faith, there's a direct correlation between the amount of word you have in you and the amount of faith you have. I cannot have more faith than I have word. It's just the way it is. My goal in life, here's my goal. You want to say, what is your goal, friends? My goal in life is to make the time frame between a body slam and me completely trusting and praising God be down to instantaneous. That's my goal. A nanosecond. That means I'm not going to care what is happening externally because I'm so enthralled about what God is doing. Whoa, did you feel that earthquake? It was unbelievable. <laughs> because I'm so enthralled about what God is doing internally. Six, Abraham received the promised land by faith, though the fulfillment would not come from many generations. Genesis, I am, the, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land you have possessed. But Abraham uh, uh, replied, O sovereign Lord, how can I be sure that I will actually possess it. And, and the Lord didn't say, here's your guarantee. He said, are you all in? God's not going to pamper you. God's never felt sorry for you. He's not looking at your life and saying, I know. You, you should have unbelief because of what's happened. He's saying, you should believe me because of what's happened. I don't want to get to heaven and watch videotape replays of all the things he's done, and then I realize I had spent years not believing him. So what did, what did he say? When he asked the question, very next verse, he says, how can I be sure? God says, bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, a pigeon. God goes, are, are you all in? I'm not going to pamper you. I'm going to raise you to be a strong man of God. So Abraham presented all these and then even when vultures tried to come and attack it, Abraham, no, I will not let anything allow unbelief to come into my heart. What are the vultures? Unbelief, fear, doubt, discouragement. No! Six, do I trust God even when I am required to wait? That's the principle here. Waiting is your longest season. Those who wait upon the Lord. I believe it's meant to be. Waiting is not passive. It's a passionate season. I am passionately waiting on God. I'm awake waiting. 
Number seven, at God's command, Abraham circumcised every male in his family. Abraham, okay, look at this in verse nine. Then God said to Abraham, your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. Abraham bowed down to the ground, but he laughed in himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of 100? How can Sarah have a baby when she's 90, 90 years old? So Abraham said to God, may Ishmael live under your special blessing. God replied, no, Sarah, your wife, will give birth. Let me say, he circumcised every male. He circumcised himself. I just want to say as a guy. That would be a difficult thing. <laughs> and again, to then circumcise all hundreds of his men. This is not, I'm not going to check out that red box video in heaven, okay? This is a bloody day here. A painful day. I mean, what God's saying is, it's going to cost you something to follow me. You are a set apart people. Don't join the crowd. You are my people. You know, I remember we used to sing the song, we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit. And I remember just like, how long are we going to sing that song? I can't wait to stop singing that song. It just didn't have the rhythm I was looking for in the words. <laughs> have I acted simply in obedience to God and not because I understood the significance of what I was doing? I'm not going to do it till I understand it. Understanding is so overrated. He promises you the peace beyond your understanding. So you don't want peace? It's up to you. If you're waiting for peace to come only when you understand something, you're not going to have a lot of peace. Because peace will come, peace will come by trusting God in faith. Jesus had peace in the middle of the storm. So much peace, he was asleep. Eight, Abraham prayed for Sodom. I love this negotiation. It's, it's a Jewish thing. He just began to negotiate. How about 50, 40, 30, 20? Give me 10. So it's... Uh, I was the first non-Jewish president of our fraternity. So tell me, all my friends were Jewish. Okay, anyway, am I eager... <laughs> So anyway, he negotiates with God. We'll skip that. Number eight, am I eager to see people punished or do I care for them in spite of their sinfulness? What if I said to you, you know, we live in an age of vengeance, economic vengeance. I'm going to make you pay. Economic revenge. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Some people are, are calling justice, justice, when it's really revenge. Jesus, I don't want God to be fair with me. I want mercy. <laughs> Please don't be fair. Mercy will triumph over judgment. The day I let mercy triumph over judgment in my heart, and I'm willing to to bless my enemies, to love my enemies, those who have hurt me the most in life. Number nine, Abraham admitted to wrongdoing and took actions. He said that his wife was her, his sister, which is kind of true because they have the same father, but King Abimelech, ultimately, he had to apologize to him. Number nine, when I sin is my tendency to cover up or confess? Do I practice the truth that an apology must sometimes be accompanied by restitution? Right now in the body of Christ, if you don't know about it, then don't worry about it. But some of us are aware that there, there are things happening. There's a particular leader in the body of Christ who's had people come and a lot of people and make statements about their actions that he is presently denying completely. He's an icon. He's a man I grew up honoring and respecting. And at this point, he's saying no. I still have time to sin. 
mean, and I, I have sinned in my life. I still have time to blow my life, life up. It would take me about a minute to blow my life up. So I have a lot of time ahead to see great things or horrible things. Abraham took responsibility and said, I was wrong. Everyone say, I was wrong. Not that hard. Now you just got to direct it to the right person, and we're there. Ten, Abraham prepared to sacrifice his son. You know, again, this is like the, the mountaintop. Everything you're waiting for comes down to it's been a great life. Glad you had your seed of promise. Glad he's grown up. Now kill him. Whatever I'm attached to, it better be Jesus. Because everything else will slip through my fingers. And that is the great test in life. Number 10, in what way has my life demonstrated that I will not allow anything to come before God? Am I willing to give up what is most important to me in order to do what is most important to God? Let's all stand together. I'm going to have us pray, and I want you to consider. I'm going to give you nine questions, questions that I'm asking myself. This is kind of like my last official message here. I'll have another message and transitional message in September. But this, to me, I felt was a very, I haven't done a great job with it, okay? But I felt it was a great overview of where I've been, where I am, where I'm going for all of us. So why don't you close your eyes and just let me ask you the same questions I'm asking myself. Will I trust God with my future? If not, why not? And when you find out why not, will you kill that thing? It's your enemy. Will I trust him even when I seem to be receiving unfair treatment? All of us will receive unfair treatment. Joseph, Jesus, Paul, Peter, on and on. Number three, will my faithfulness to others show my trust in God's faithfulness? I, I want to be there for people. If I'm wondering what God loves, it's people. God wants me to have a heart always, at any given moment, to reach out to any person he tugs on my heart to reach out to. Number four, will I give proper honor to God, my first and best of my time, my talents, and treasures? Number five, will I consciously reaffirm my trust in God's promises? I don't care what I see, what I feel, what's happening. I trust your promises in my life. They are yes, and I say amen to them. Number six, will I trust God even when I am required to wait? I want to wait patiently on the Lord that I might renew my strength. Number seven, will I simply act in obedience to God and not because I understand the significance of what he's asking me to do? I don't have to understand. I just have to believe that you know what's about to happen and what should happen, and I trust you. Number eight, will I e be eager to see people punished? Or will I care for them in spite of their sinfulness? Lord, I don't, I don't deserve mercy, but you gave it to me. Let me give that to others. Let mercy triumph over judgment. Number nine, when I sin, will my tendency be to cover up or confess? Will I turn myself in? Will I keep short accounts? Will I run to the light instead of away? Do I practice the truth that an apology must sometimes be accompanied by restitution? Number 10, will I allow anything to come before God? Lord, these are holy sentences. I thank you, Lord, for um, this incredible season, Lord, of being uh, a leader in this church, Lord. It's hard to talk about it too much without getting too emotional to even talk. So I'll just kind of skip the rock over the water and just say it's been an honor to have grown up here. I pray for the sons and daughters in this house, 
that they would know their future is bright, that they would trust you with their future, that they would be, believe and stand upon your promises, that no weapon formed them will prosper, that they will finish well. Nothing they've done has disqualified them. It's a simple act of repentance that will bring each of us back into a right relationship with you at any given moment. I thank you for Brandon and Rachel, the elders and leaders who are here, the incredible leaders that you have handpicked, Lord, to lead this church family, Lord. And even though we're not landing the plane at this moment, Lord, we, we're putting the tray tables up. <laughs> and we're recognizing, Lord, that we're coming to a landing. And we are grateful, Lord, for who you are, for what you've done, for what you are doing, and that our future is bright, Lord. The future of the Rock of Roseville is bright, Lord. Lord, I thank you for um, just this message today, Lord. Use it for your glory, for your honor, in Jesus' name.